regarding uh, Yitziat Mitzrayim, what extra biblical evidence exists to support the Torah's claim? Why? And we also want to understand why this matters since the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. So uh, what, is, what is the gain from trying to, to glean over these extra biblical sources? And in your book, Animamin, uh, you make a fascinating observa- observation regarding the usage of the term Yad Chazaka. Um, and can you expand on that idea? I think the viewers would really enjoy that. Okay. If, if there's one thing that many people know from what this whole area called biblical criticism, it's the claim that there was no exodus. And the claim is not so far-fetched because there is, doesn't seem to be any evidence for the exodus. There are there are there is no mention of Hebrews in any Egyptian text, no mention of Israelites, no mention of Moshe, no mention of slaves getting up and leaving. Obviously, there's no mention of plagues. Um, it is impossible that there were two or three million people who got up and left because there's no the 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 the, the, the countries at the time were not big enough. Uh, and so the whole thing is, is, you know, it's one thing to say. You know, you can't prove to me that Avram Avinu never existed. That's right. That's right. And there you can say, you know, the ab- the absence of, ev- of evidence is an evidence of absence. But when you have so many things and there's no no mention of it, it seems kind of damning. Okay. Uh, and my there's claim a response. You can't just leave it like that because because people would say that since there's no, nothing really going. Yeah. What I'm saying is that the question is not a ridiculous question. Okay. And my claim, my claim is that. Uh, 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 we've all been looking in the wrong place. What we've tried to do is to say, hmm, well, the Torah says all these things. Now let's go to our, what we know about Egypt and our Egyptian texts and look for the Torah in these Egyptian texts. And I say, as they say in Yiddish, Taker, with the turnaround. To see proof for the Exodus, you have to take what you know or we know about Egypt and see how much the Torah seems to know about very specific texts and very specific individuals, okay? Uh, in broad, in broad uh, fashion, the Torah engages in what is called cultural appropriation. That is where an oppressed people takes the propaganda of their oppressors and uses it for themselves. We see this in the phrase, Yad Chazaka Bizra a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Uh, we might think of that, yeah, it's just the Torah is just using hyperbole to describe the Kaddish Baruch Hu's strength. But what's really interesting is that within the Torah itself, within the Tanakh itself, this phrase, Yad Chazakam, the Zerah Nituya is used exclusively with regard to Yitziat Mitzrayim. We never see another miracle outside of the, the, the description of the Exodus where the Torah says, oh, and what Hashem did here, hmm, that's his Yad Chazakam, the Zerah Nituya. What's fascinating is that when you look in the inscriptions of ancient Egypt in the period called the New Kingdom, 1500, 1200 BCE, which is roughly the period that tradition would say is the period of the enslavement, then what you see is that the the pharaohs are routinely lauded in these inscriptions for having performed all of their escapades with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, whether it's defeating the Libyans, whether it's going on a hunting trip and bagging 120 elephants, whether it's finding a diamond the size of a the size the size the size of a, of a football, and all these things, all these inscriptions say, "Oh, the Pharaoh, geez, what a mighty hand and outstretched arm he had." Along comes the Torah and says, "We're going to out Pharaoh the Pharaoh. We're going to steal your thunder, and we are going to say that a Kaddish Baruch Hu defeating the Pharaoh is he is using the mighty hand and the outstretched arm." Okay? There's a whole bunch of phrases in the story of Itziat Mitzrayim that do that. That by itself is really cool. That itself does not prove that there was Yitzhak and Trine, Okay, But I want to show you something that I think uh, 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 begins to do that. Let's see if I can bring back this uh, PowerPoint. Uh, okay, let's, uh, let's go to the beginning. Okay, we were here. All right, we're going to move on. Okay, all right. All right, I want to tell you about one particular king. Ramses II, okay? Ramses II is also called Ramses the Great. In fact, if, if, if I mentioned before this period called the, the Egyptian New Kingdom, 1500 to 1200 BCE, that is the zenith of Egypt, Egyptian history. And the greatest king of this period is Ramses II. And his greatest achievement was a battle that he had 
against the Hittite Empire over here. And it was at a place called uh, Kadesh, right on the, on the border between Lebanon and Syria. And what, when he comes back to, um, to Egypt, he plasters the place with inscriptions about this event. In fact, there's no event in all of ancient history, Greece and Rome included, that is so widely publicized as the Battle of Kadesh. He has written inscriptions, accounts, and also these reliefs. You know, what you're looking at here, pictures. Now, some of these pictures are really, really interesting in terms of the Torah. We'll see what we have here. They're very confusing. They're like, ah, there's so much going on here. This is at the Battle of Kadesh. This is Ramsey's throne, throne uh, it's his camp, his military encampment. You can see it's got a wall around it, okay? And in the middle, his throne tent. Can you see with my cursor what I'm doing? I'm pointing to the throne tent, okay? Now his throne tent, trust me, when you look at, when you measure it, then you discover, well, you see there's two chambers, okay? One of the chambers is two by one. And the other chamber is one by one. You see this elsewhere too, in another place. Again, here's the wall around the encampment. Here's the throne tent, two chambers. One of them is two by one. One of them is one by one, okay? And here's a third one in a different place. Here's the wall around the machane. Here's his armies all around. And in the middle, you have, uh, uh, you have uh, two by one and one by one, okay? Now, why do I mention all this? Well, because having an encampment, a military encampment, with a fence around it, with a kind of tent in the middle that has two chambers, one of them two by one, and one of them one by one, well, that's the Mishkan, okay? Wow. In other words, what we see here is that the basic design of the throne camp, of the, 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 the military camp of Ramses II, with his throne tent in the middle, having two chambers, one of them two by one in proportion, one of them one by one in proportion, with the entrance from the east. In Egyptian maps, the east is on the left. Wrap your head around that one, but it's just true, okay? And we have exactly the same thing with the Mishkan. Am Yisrael, as a military camp, the Sefer Bamidbar, surrounds the Mishkan, entrance on the east, a tent in the middle, the king's tent, as it were, two chambers, one of them is one by one, one of them one by one, one of them is two by one, okay? Exactly the same. In fact, in fact, if you look here at this particular representation of it, can you see what's going on here? These are falcons with their wings spread, okay? Mm-hmm. In Egyptian mythology, that's Horus, okay? The god Horus. And in the middle is, this is a, a, the name, Ramses II. They are hovering over him. Right? Just like we have in the Mishkan, you have Kruvim hovering over the Aron Habrit. Now, what is going on here? Why is there this similarity? And I will tell you that this similarity is highly distinct. That is, there are no other temples that we know of in the ancient Near East that are a tent, with two by one and one by one, with a wall around it. And there are no other throne, there are no other military camps that have a throne tent in the middle like this, two by one, one by one, okay? And the claim is, this, this already scholars discovered in the 1930s, the thought was, ah, this is a further extension of that idea that I mentioned before of cultural appropriation. That is, this would suggest that Israelites were actually present in Egypt, something happened to them, and they felt that the way in which they were going to celebrate God was by, by the, what, the, what the Torah is essentially saying is that you all saw these pictures all over Egypt, right? That we saw here and here and here and here and here. Oops, sorry, here. Uh, these were so famous, these images that the Torah says here to help you understand this very abstract concept of God, we're going to now defeat Ramses II at his own game and have an exodus and Hashem's tent will be like, like the greatest king of the greatest period of Egyptian history, celebrating his greatest event, the, the battle of, 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 of Kadesh. So this is cultural appropriation. This is taking the propaganda of the pharaohs and using it against them. Okay? And what I have done further from what these scholars uh, have pointed out about these images of 
the throne camp of uh, 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 the, 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 the military camp of Ramses II and the throne tent in the middle, I went a step further and said, well, I want to read the stories of what he says happened at the Battle of Kadesh. And what I was able to show is that the story of Yitziat Mitzrayim, especially Perak Yudal and Tedvav, Kriyat Yamsu, and, uh, 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 and Shirat Hayam, it all follows almost line by line in many, many places. And a lot of the imagery is the same. You know, uh, here, I'll just show you one, one more thing that's like you know, really pretty cool about this. Where were we? We were here. So for example, um, let's just see. Yeah, it says that they, they, they drowned just like we have in the water here. Okay, uh, one more image. Okay, here, here, all right. Um, this is almost any Pharaoh. This is the iconic image of Pharaohs all over Egypt. What is the pharaoh doing here? In his left hand, that's this, he is holding the hair of POWs, okay? And in his right hand, he has a mace and he is about to shatter their heads. Every pharaoh posed for a picture like this. You see this all over Egypt, okay? Now, this is what the Torah means when it says, Yemincha Hashem Tiratz Oyev, your right hand shatters the enemy, okay? It's taking from the Egyptian propaganda and using it against the Egyptians in celebration of a Kaddish Baruch Hu. Let me just conclude this, friend, by saying, if you want to see all this stuff, you know, all of the, uh, the pictures that we have here, uh, uh, that we had of the, of the Mishkan and all these things, you can actually go and visit these because next January, I am leading a trip, a tour to Egypt. And you can actually touch mud bricks with straw and you can read the name Miriam in hieroglyphics. I am leading a tour with uh, Kesher Tours, Kesher with a K, Kesher Tours. Next January, it's called In the Footsteps of the Exodus. It will be the first ever kosher tour to Egypt with a Tanakh in hand to show us all these amazing things that we can learn about our Masora from visiting Egypt. Wow, you're really doing that's unbelievable. unbelievable. Out of curiosity, are you working on any future books? Yeah, Emir Tzashem, I'm finishing just now uh, a, a book on Eicha. Really? Won't be ready in time for next week, but uh, yeah, Eicha is an amazing, amazing safer, amazing safer. It's an amazing safer. Uh, yeah, but that's for a different discussion. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. This was amazing. Great yeah. stuff. We hope I have you on a little favor. A little, I think that little section that we just did on the Mishkan, you know, and, and those uh, those reliefs is, you know, visually very cool, you it know. Is.